So in the case of a Lambertian model, um, the BRDF is constant, it turns out. So the only part that's really left is, um, okay, this doesn't look constant here. Um, it still depends when I put it in this expression. Um, it, it depends on still the angle with, that the light source makes with respect to the surface. But um, again, as I said, that's, that will decrease the amount of energy coming in. And this ratio is based on comparing the amount coming in to the amount going out. So if I make this constant, then I get a Lambertian model. So that's one special case of this. So that gives you the easiest case, and then you can handle all the other cases through various complicated expressions here. You can go off and research that on your own if you like. But I just want to give you the sense that you know, people do these simple kinds of hacks to generate and render scenes very quickly, but then they also know how to do it in the complex way. But there's a lot of research going on in trying to make this more efficient. And um, it's quite challenging, especially when we get to the problems of virtual reality when we want even higher resolution, right, and faster frame rates. We want higher quality. So it's going to push us more towards making some kind of hacks, but the hacks end up looking worse in virtual reality because we can move our heads around, we can see a lot more than we could on a simple screen. And that some of the details I will get to. Um, one of the complications that VR causes right away for these kinds of problems is that the viewing direction, right, I get one viewing direction on a screen, but if I have stereo rendering going on, I have two different viewing directions, right? So that's one simple complication that happens right away, one clear complication that happens right away is that I have two different viewing directions to take into account here each time. So that's already at least doubled the amount of work or so it seems, right? Does that make sense? So stereo, just because I'm rendering to each eye, I have different viewpoints for each eye. Um, I, I, I told the mathematics of it when I gave the geometry of the transforms that you just perform a simple shift, but already you have to do more than a simple shift here. You have to calculate um, some difference reflectance. If it's diffuse, it might not matter, but if you have a, a specular component, right, if it starts looking very close to a mirror, then for that to look right, you'll have to very carefully take into account each one of the eyes. The left and right eye should see uh, different light, should receive different light. Does that seem correct? Right? <clears throat> right, questions? I want to now um, move over to the, um, the, the next part, which is the object-oriented rendering. Um, object order rendering. I keep saying object oriented because of, of C++ and other object oriented programming models and things. So, um, so I don't mean that. Uh, object order rendering, which again is going to be um, looping over the triangles first for us. I'm still going to have to take into account shading somewhere in this, in this uh, pipeline of processing. So these concepts still are relevant. I'm not going to cheat our way out of this. So we're up to um, object order, object order rendering. And if you've had computer graphics background before, if you've had a course on it before, um, try to think about what's unique to virtual reality as we go through these things, right, as we're reviewing some of this material. Um, <coughs> all right, so in this case, the most important step is rasterization. And this is, um, you know, object-oriented rendering and rasterization is the most common um, method in uh, GPUs. So this is mainly what's going on in hardware. This is the approach that has been widely used in, in industry, not the um, ray tracing methods. And there's a lot of complications to what's going on here, but by um, being object-oriented order rendering, remember that I said it's going to be triangle by triangle. Triangle by triangle. Um, <clears throat> let me draw part of a screen here. Okay, this is getting tedious. Good enough. <laughs> so I have some kind of low resolution image here, right? And this is the, um, suppose this is what I'm going to ultimately render to my display. This is how the display will look. And um, 
we are going triangle by triangle and you might recall the um the transformations that we did uh quite a few lectures ago um where we talked about <coughs> if I define a triangle in the body frame I move it into the world frame and then I perform more transformations to figure out exactly where it ends up in terms of pixel coordinates. Well, if I do all of that then I end up with a triangle here somewhere. Right, so, my triangle will end up somewhere with pixel coordinates and as I said when I covered that topic these pixel coordinates do not need to line up exactly with the integer or integral values of the pixels right they do not necessarily end up being integers just some floating point numbers and now we end up with a triangle here and we have to figure out now in the rasterization process um which ones of these pixels to to color based on the light hitting that triangle right. That makes sense um how do we decide that well one simple way to do it and one very common way to do it is to just do take a pole at the center of each one of these uh pixels and then color in the pixel based on these shading models whichever you decide to use if the center ends up falling inside of the triangle. So, you have a inside outside test that you need to implement to determine whether or not the a point a sample point is inside or outside of the triangle and then you go along and shade it in. Um I guess we could try this here. So, if I go stepping along this is outside this is outside this is a bad example maybe. So, maybe this is just barely inside. So, I decide to color that and I will just pick a color here and uh, color it in and um let's see outside 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 coming along here ok this is on the border you do have to decide what to do in those cases let us see we are right on the border here I will say these are all inside. So, I color these and coming along again let us see it looks like this would be inside this is in these are all inside that is outside let us see this is inside this one looks like it is inside. So, it looks like try to draw a nice outline of this. Um, so, it looks like the rasterized version of this triangle from my somewhat haphazard example looks like that right. Does that even look like a triangle anymore? Not too much. So, with very very poor uh, low level of resolution if that is a very small triangle maybe maybe have a high resolution display you end up with a significant amount of um distortion of the triangle. This problem <coughs> is generally referred to as aliasing and you end up with significant distortion um of the say the geometry of the triangle. Um, we will talk about that as we as we go along I will talk about anti aliasing methods. <clears throat> so, if we are going triangle by triangle of course, you probably do not want to scan the entire image to figure out where one tiny triangle has landed. So, um you can develop very simple tests to eliminate most of this image when performing these samples in the center of each one of these pixels to determine if it is inside or outside of the triangle. So, you can do some simple tests to uh cull away let us say um large portions of the of this image that you are making. Um the next problem outside of that after determining um where the um where the triangle falls in terms of pixels the next problem we have is called the depth ordering problem. In other words um which triangle is in front. Um we had the same thing when we talked about ray tracing I mentioned that you extend a ray and you have to figure out which triangle is hit first. So, the problem does not go away you have to figure out essentially the same thing here if there is a kind of virtual camera looking at this image I need to figure out which triangle do I see first and um especially at let us say at a particular pixel um is this triangle in front or is there some other triangle that would be in front of this in my scene after I have placed all the triangles into the appropriate place here. Well, this might seem easy enough I can apply what is called the painters algorithm
which is just sort the triangles by furthest to nearest. That is with respect to the eye that is looking at the triangles right. So, from furthest to nearest <coughs> and then and then paint or in other words do the rendering. So, it is called the painters algorithm I will say paint then paint in far to near order All right. So, that sounds really easy and then I can just quickly loop over all of my triangles and if I have them ordered nicely I start with the ones that are furthest away and if I start rendering the ones that are closer later the whole thing should work Does that makes sense. So, that I just destroy whatever I have rendered before and I do not worry about it this makes a very simple loop for going through and rendering everything correctly. Um, two problems with that uh, one problem is that the sorting is too costly. you have millions of triangles you pay um, O of n log n time for the best sorting algorithms you end up with um, um, too much time spent on sorting. Another problem is um, what is called a depth cycle <coughs> see if I can if I can draw these correctly here. Um, trying to draw a triangle. So, let us see I have this triangle appears to be in front of that triangle, but then I make let us see another part here that is in front of this one I will erase that All right, continue this one onward make it look kind of fixed a bit here. And now, hmm, I think I'd like to make this part of the triangle look like it's behind this. Is that okay? So, which triangle is in front? All right. So, um, so in three dimensions, just pointing out, this doesn't happen in two dimensions if you just arrange some line segments. But in three dimensions, there's no. Um, well defined notion of in front in some cases right. So, you cannot simply sort from um from far to near you have to take into account these in some special way by breaking them into pieces. So, it is still not a clean solution. So, how is this problem solved in rendering? What do people normally use in graphics because of this? What is used in a GPU? Anybody know? There is no graphics gurus here uh z buffers right. So, z buffers end up getting used. So, I will explain that briefly as the main technique <coughs> and then we will start to talk about um, um <coughs> well, I will talk exactly about how the um how the pixels are getting shaded in these buffers and then we will start to talk about the virtual reality problems, but probably be after the break into the next lecture for that by the time we get to that part. Okay, so we're going to give up on the painter's algorithm for a bit. It's it's it can be used as I said if you take into account depth cycles in some special way and if you're not afraid of the sorting cost. <coughs> the z buffer um and remember that in in computer graphics the z axis has been chosen so that it corresponds to depth, right, which is distance from the viewing direction. So, you could also call this a depth buffer if you want it is also fine just the z coordinate is what people always end up using. So, they just identify that with depth and so, what you do in this case is you store a depth value All right. So, some z value at each pixel. So, in the image you are making <coughs> imagine you decide to you, you rendered a triangle you have colored the pixels with RGB values which I have not exactly said how to do yet, but you do that, but you also store the depth for exactly that pixel All right. So, you go ahead and do that 
Now you can render the triangles in arbitrary order, in other words in unsorted order any way you like and then you render the pixel in other words you assign the RGB values only if the new Z value the new Z value is what? What should the new Z value correspond to? So, if I have already been drawing on on the screen I have been coloring in pixels I now have a new triangle that I want to render I will only render it if it is in front right. So, that means that it is Z value should be less depending on whether Z is increasing or decreasing depending on how we set things up, but only if the Z value is less then the stored Z value and is it less or greater to be careful there depending on how the coordinate systems are set up it should correspond to being closer um, in other words the new one new point new point is closer than the um, stored one. So, that is the important part not necessarily less, but it actually corresponds to being closer to the um, virtual eye. All right. Questions about that? Ok, let me mention just a little bit more and then we can take a break. So, I want to talk about clipping and culling. Um, these are both very related and people use the terms sometimes interchangeably sometimes quite distinctly, but basically it means eliminating triangles from full consideration in this uh, rendering pipeline here. So, rather than going all the way to the stage of calculating RGB values for every pixel there may be a quick way to know that you do not need to look at them. Um, for example, this usually is called simple clipping um, remove triangles that are behind the eye right. So, behind the viewpoint right. So, there is a particular point at which you are viewing the scene everything that is behind why not just do a simple test and you know make it make a simple flag that just eliminates all of those from consideration right. So, we can skip over all of those triangles that end up being behind. So, that is very easy kind of clipping. I should point out something that is already interesting with respect to virtual reality here. If I am looking at an image on a screen and it is not taking into account the viewpoint adjustments because of tracking our head then um this clipping let us say a clipping plane imagine a vertical clipping plane that eliminates everything behind me that remains fixed right when you are just looking at a fixed screen. Now, what should I do in virtual reality where should I put the clipping plane? I could put it exactly where my eyes are and then I could have it move with me. So, that clipping occurs what if I put it hmm, but it, even if I do that I think it means that if I have some geometry some information those are some walls or something in front of me I should be able to put my face up very close to it right. So, that in the virtual world it is only 1 centimeter in front of my eyes what is going to happen in that case? Is it going to be in focus? If I have a head mounted display and I, I put my face up to it and it is 1 centimeter away let us say I do that in the real world I put something up 1 centimeter away from my eyes it does not look like it is in focus to me and if I if you did the same experiment yourself my guess is it would not be in focus to you. Can your eyes converge and give a stereo picture there? can't do that either, but in virtual reality you can very easily render things all the way up to 1 centimeter away from your eyes they will remain in focus because if you remember the optics of the screen and the lens in front of your eyes it will remain in focus, but you can't converge on it. So, it is a terribly uncomfortable situation what do you do? Well, you could move the clipping plane further away so that as soon as anything gets be within let us say be safe maybe 15 centimeters of your eyes you just clip it. So, what is wrong with that solution? 
Yeah, now it vanishes. So, now it doesn't look too good. If I want to come up and put my face up to the board in VR, I have a virtual board here, the board just disappears. Well, that doesn't look right either. So, what should we do? I don't have a good answer for that. But I'm just pointing this out, right? And if I turn my head at an angle and I start putting it up to the board like this, right? So, um, so, so I'm turning my head at an angle and, I, and I, I come in like this, then this eye is getting closer to the board, my right eye is getting closer to the board than my left eye. So, that means the clippings are not going to match exactly. And I have to get things matching with in stereo with my eyes, right? So, I'll have mismatched clippings too to deal with. So, I may have some parts of the board that both eyes can see and in some parts of the board that have been eliminated for one of the eyes but included for the other. So, so that's a mess, right? So, there's already even with something as simple as clipping, there is already a mismatch problem and some kind of difficulty corresponding to virtual reality because of this vergence and accommodation conflict that we talked about. Um, it is always in focus. The fact that you can move your head, what should happen, um, all of these come into play here um, with regard to virtual reality. So, how do we deal with that? Not completely sure, but I am just letting you know that this is a problem. So, more complicated kinds of culling operations which I will not cover in detail, but I just want to point these out is that there is um, the remaining part of the clipping is to cull away or clip away um, everything outside of the viewing frustum. You might remember the frustum from our transformations that we did. So, remove triangles outside of our viewing frustum. So, that is one kind of calling that goes on. There is also occlusion calling. This could be quite complex, but this is if you know that a bunch of triangles are behind some large object, then you can remove them. Now, of course, you have to do very complicated visibility analysis and reasoning to accomplish that. It might be too complex to do the calculations. Nevertheless, in many settings, it is worth considering. So, remove what are called hidden and then another one is back face calling which in this case is um, <coughs> remove triangles on the back of an object. Okay, that looks a lot like the occlusion case, but the back face in particular, the surface normals are pointing the wrong way. So, they are pointing away from the light source. So, you know they are not going to contribute anything. So, remove these. And of course, if you have a problems with your model, which is very common, especially if this model was constructed in some kind of automatic way, um, using SLAM, for example, um, you may have some inconsistencies. You may have some of the triangles with the normals pointing in the wrong direction accidentally, and then. Um, you have to be very careful, you will get these operations wrong. So, <coughs> so remove these. Um, so, these are just several operations that happen to try to reduce the number of triangles in each step. And there is a lot of important work that has gone on here, a lot of experimentation, a lot of highly optimized efficient algorithms that get implemented in the in graphical processing units in hardware to do all of this efficiently. So, that gives you the idea of this graphical rendering pipeline which has been very well optimized for computer graphics on a screen but not so well optimized for uh, virtual reality. And so, we have to go back and rethink about all these things that happen and are they appropriate for us in the virtual reality context. You can use them because they exist, right? They're, you can buy a graphics card, plug it in and start using these operations, but are they right for virtual reality? Some yes, some no. One final thing I should say about Z buffers and I will take a break is that um, Z buffers are also very useful for rendering shadows. Um, if you want you can move the viewpoint instead of being the viewpoint of the um, observer you can make the viewpoint be a light source and then you can take a look at the ordering of objects with respect to the light source and calculate where shadows will fall. So, Z buffers are also useful for calculating shadows I just wanted to point that out as another side uh, benefit of using Z buffers. Questions on this?